um, you know, with uh, dehydration. And um, uh, it took me a few a couple of days to recover from that. Uh, now I'm a little bit better, maybe back to myself to some degree the way I was before. So that we did, it's a good idea we do it on Sunday. Um, in, in saying this year today, uh, so uh, I wanted to really talk about the parsha, even though Sunday is really for mitzvahs, but I felt strongly about the parsha because uh, parsha is Yitro, and Yitro is all about conversion. And I would think that this is the, uh, a lot of people have that on the top of their minds. Uh, and it's a uh, priority. Uh, we can discuss all kinds of mitzvahs. Uh, it would be probably foolish to discuss the mitzvah of Pesach uh, on Rosh Hashanah or vice versa. Um, you got to discuss what's of immediate relevance. And um, for many of us, the immediate relevance is the mitzvah of conversion. I'd like to do that mitzvah. And uh, <clears throat> and in doing that mitzvah, uh, let's uh, know, learn the rules and the different uh, mitzvahs involved and the different uh, uh, procedures of that mitzvah. Um, just like you learn the procedures of the mitzvah of Shabbos. And... Uh, you do this and you do that and you don't do this, you don't do that. Then you get a perspective, you get an idea of what, what's all about. So uh, why should we not do the same thing with regards to conversion? Now, it is also noteworthy that um, th that uh, in this parsha, the Jewish people received the Torah. And that's a conversion too, because we weren't officially Jewish or B'nai Israel or God's people until we received the Torah. The Torah is, uh, uh, is the definitive, uh, um, uh, definitive uh, uh, determination of being Jewish. And uh, if every nation has its culture, ours is the Torah. The sadness about that is that many who are not religious don't have the, the Torah knowledge or observance. They really are. Uh, they really are really missing the essence of our culture as a people. Uh, well, yes, I heard that uh, the Jews keep Saturday instead of Sunday. But I don't know, well, I have the faintest idea of how they do Saturday Shabbos. And that's so sad. That's why learning about a mitzvah, okay, good. learning the details of it is so special and so, uh, and so significant. And so um, the uh, Yitro converts and of course, um, uh, and the Jewish people convert as a whole. And it's all within the same structure of the Torah. Uh, I might also add one other point before we get into the details, and that is um, uh, maybe um, the last detail. Kind of funny to give the last detail first, but uh, I'll give you the last detail first anyway, because the name of the Parsha is Yitro. Yes, he's a significant figure, and that's why it's the name of the Parsha. Uh, the name of the Parsha is named after him because his name is significant, significant to his story, significant to his, um, to his conversion. Now, uh, everybody knows that a name is significant. Um, everyone should be proud of their name. It identifies me, tells, it tells me and others who I am. And then how, uh, what I represent. And of course, uh, the Jewish name is very significant. So significant, in fact, that the rabbis learn 
that one of the three reasons why the Jewish people were merited to leave Mitzrayim, to get the opportunity for emancipation, was because of the fact that even after 210 years in Mitzrayim, they would not change their names. They maintained uniquely Jewish, different names. Uh, the other two factors were that they maintained their language, which is very important to determine, you know, uh, open, open who you are. You know, a lot of immigrants come to America um, and keep their language, which is a, a pride, you know, Hispanics speak Spanish. And while they should learn English, it's also important that they keep their heritage. Um, and the Jews, unfortunately, have not. The Jews don't know Hebrew and don't know, they don't know uh, uh, our, our mother tongue. And uh, this is something we need to work on. But they did that in Egypt. They didn't forget their language. And uh, whoops, now we, my turn to be rude. Okay. Okay. I know you want to talk to me, but I can't because. Oh, oh okay, Chaim. So are you available? My sister wants to come over and say hello. No, I'm in Sheer. You're in Sheer now. When are you going to be free? An hour. An hour? Yes. Oh, okay, fine. Thank you. So um, uh, <clears throat> I couldn't be ruled as my son. <laughs> Otherwise, I would have been rude. <laughs> anyway, <clears throat> the other thing, by the way, in terms of identification and culture, is that the Jews didn't switch their garments. They dressed differently. So I guess if you really wanted to assimilate, you'd start speaking the, the Egyptian language, using Egyptian names, and, and, and dressing Egyptian, uh, which is what we did mostly in America. Not good. Not if you want to maintain your identity. Not if you're proud of your heritage. So um, in Mitzrayim, they didn't do that. They kept and isolated themselves and identified themselves, even though that wasn't very good to do. Because by identifying yourself, then you, uh, then you give away that you're a slave. And, um, but we did it anyway. Uh, and that's to our credit why Hashem took us out of Mitzrayim. Nevertheless, uh, names are very important. So one of the important things to learn is that is that um, when you uh, w w when you um, uh, convert, you're supposed to change your name. So everyone out there should be thinking about a name that they would like to adopt. That and and, and you, you know you people get a special gift. Um, I, I didn't choose my name. Um, my mother, Allah Shalom, chose my name. But but you have a chance to choose your name. So choose it right. If you want my assistance, that's I'll surely give it to you. But certainly you have a chance to choose your own name. You got to change your name. Yitro changed his name. How do I know? For a fact, Yitro had seven of them. And... Uh, uh, and we often want to make a little joke and say that the, the reason he had seven names because he had seven daughters. And the fact is, is that when you uh, <clears throat> uh, hold on just one second, we'll just get the background noise quiet. Hold on a minute. <clears throat> Sorry. So uh, Yitro had seven names. And of course, we humorously say that's consistent with seven daughters. Because when you have seven daughters and you got to marry off seven, seven daughters and find seven husbands and you got to make seven weddings, you can go broke. 
And then the creditors come after you. So you change your name so they can't run after you. So that's why he changes them. That's not true. Anyway, that's a little joke. But seven names, one of them was named Yeter. The word Yeter comes from the Hebrew word Yoter. Yoter means more or extra. In other words, that there is a parsha in the Torah added with his name. Now, an extra parsha came into the Torah because of him, because of Yeter. Now, Yeter wants to change his name to when he becomes Jewish. So he adds above the end of the word, it becomes Yitro. Now, maybe a slight change, but change nevertheless. If you change in your spirit and change in your, uh, your life, um, in your soul, change your name. And the change of the name is extremely important, particularly when, let's say, a person uh, is in a great, great danger or a great difficulty, uh, particularly illness. So often people, times people say that you should, if not change your name, add a name. A lot of names are changed at the time of illness uh, uh, because uh, to show that this is not the same person. If God forbid the same this person was destined to be ill, uh, the name change is a different person. He's not destined to be ill, and therefore the illness can be removed. So, same thing here: when you change your lifestyle, such as conversion, a brand new name, and the adoption of a brand new name is not just that it's used at the ceremony, or I have this Hebrew name, but rather. It means that you also use it and it becomes part of you. Anyway, that's the final step in conversion. Uh, when you, when we still, when we do the ceremony, and many of you who are on the Zoom today have gone through the ceremony and remember, uh, after the mikvah and after uh, the, all the, the testing and so forth, um, we make a bracha, a mishaberach. And that bracha includes the identification of the brand new name. And that is worthy of Mazel Tov. And that's the, the, basically the conclusion of the ceremony. But uh, let's go back to the beginning. How does Yitro convert? Uh, and um, <clears throat> the conversion begins not in this parsha. The conversion begins the conversion begins <clears throat> at the beginning, <clears throat> at the beginning of the book of Shmos, the second book of the Torah, the very first parsha, where slavery began. And Paro began the slavery <clears throat> um, by premeditatingly. Uh, planning it out. Oh, man. There we go. Premeditatingly planning it out. <clears throat> the premeditation uh, means that this was malicious. And that was Paro's intention. It didn't happen because of this excuse or that excuse. It was a malicious intention. And he uses the words, Hava nitchakma lo. Hava nitchakma. Nitchakma, uh, you find it, in, I think, in the, the sixth Pasuk, in the very beginning of the book. Uh, just double check it to be sure. Um, here it is right here. Hava nitchakma is in the 10th Pasuk, the 10th verse. Nitchakma comes from the word chachma, which means wisdom, which means a plan. This is not willy-nilly. This is a plan, a plan, malicious intent to enslave the people. Um, but then he used the funny word hava. What does hava mean? So basically hava, I don't really know the real etymology of the word, but it means let us. Maybe, maybe, maybe many of you have heard of the song, Hava Nagila, Let Us Rejoice. 
the word Hava. Let's let, let, let us get together and all do this. He's talking to people. He's consulting with people. So yes, you can say consulted with the rest of his people who said, yeah, yeah, why not? You know, <laughs> uh, we could use some slaves. But it also means that he consulted with three major world leaders at the time. It was a summit conference. <clears throat> These three great men um, were Bilam and Eov and Yitro. These three were considered the great consultants of the time. These three were considered people whom, if you could get their approval, you could get away with it. Uh, similar to you know, trying to you know get the, the Nazis tried their best to to uh, to get uh, to get the world to agree with what they're doing, and the countries they conquered certainly did not oppose the deportation of Jews. They cooperated. So of course uh, the Nazis felt certainly empowered. The Um So Paro, seeking empowerment, sought out the three great minds of the day. Bilam was well known as a prophet amongst the Goyim, a sorcerer, a magician who had powers. And later on, he'll be hired by the country of Moab to curse the Jews. Of course, at the end, uh, those curses were reversed by the power that God has over everyone. But Bilam was a soldier of fortune who had nothing more than mercenary and evil intent. He said, Paro, go for it. In fact, I'd do better than that. Kill him. Who needs him? <clears throat> um, Eov was a man who would soon in the future suffer great sufferings, partially because of his response. His response was silent. The response of silence is a response of, needless to say, uh, an agreement. Uh, the, 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 the idea of of um, of uh, <clears throat> the idea of the idea of 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 uh, 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 of, of agreement um, is, is sort of like a uh, consent. Go for it. Uh, I'm not saying anything. I'm not saying here or there, but certainly I'm not protesting. And that lack of protest was one that caused him in the future suffering. The end, Bilam was punished, but he got killed for his part. And Eo, for his uh, unwillingness to protest, he got punished as well. There is this obligation on all peoples, all of humanity, to protest evil and to fight and stand up against it. <clears throat> so let's say you're a German in Nazi held Germany. And what can you do? Most of Germany uh, contended at the end of the war in 45 when judged by the Allies. We were only following orders. It wasn't our intent. I didn't mean to kill 25 Jews. Of course, uh, that doesn't cut it. Not in the God's world of right and wrong. So what are you supposed to do? If in fact you're caught in that kind of situation. And maybe as EO saw it, you can't protest. <clears throat> You'll get yourself killed. So what do you do? So Yitro did what he was, what the, the, the proper response was what Hashem would want him to do. He ran away. And that's what you need to do. You can't stay there and join in evil just to save your own skin. That's forbidden. Even though life, human life is a priority and our own lives are priorities to ourselves, not at the extent of doing harm to others. You can violate Shabbos to save a life. You can violate Yom Kippur to save a life. But you can't violate another human being to save your life. <clears throat> and so Yitro ran away. 
Now is his first step. The first step to conversion is the absolute unwillingness to protest in evil, with evil, and the absolute, <clears throat> and the absolute uh, putting your own life in jeopardy by running away and losing your status in the world, uh, losing your uh, your position, your fame, your fortune, and so forth. So uh, Mayito could have been greatly rewarded in in, in Egypt with uh, had he gone along with the <clears throat> gone along with, with, with the program, but he gave it all up and went into exile. Uh, he resigned his position in order not to participate in evil, hatred for evil. And willingness to do whatever it takes not to participate is the first step towards changing as a human being and becoming a convert. It means to first become a good human being. A chaside umas a righteous of the nations, a righteous Gentile. When a person is that, <clears throat> and particularly in protesting the harm of others uh, in his own way of not participating. And, <clears throat> and particularly for the Jewish people, that person is on his way to conversion. <clears throat> so Yitro goes to Midian and there he becomes a Kohen, a priest. Um, basically being a religious man, and having a religious ideology, he becomes and rises to leadership. He becomes a priest of the, the, the whatever idolatry they worship there. But for Yitro, it was unacceptable. He wasn't comfortable because he tried out this idolatry and tried out others. <clears throat> Similar to Avram Avinu who was born into idolatry by his father in his father's idolatry store and <clears throat> tried out all known idolatrous faiths. And so did Pietro. <clears throat> tried this, tried that, tried this, tried that, looked here, looked there, and everything came up lacking. There was no sense of truth anywhere. <clears throat> At that point, the next step is to renounce everything else. Renounce it all. There's just nothing in here, in this group of religions that speaks to me and tells me a truth. <clears throat> and so Yitro resigns his position. In resigning his position, we find out this whole story is true because when Moshe himself was banished to Midian after killing the Egyptian, um, he camped himself by a well. Many rabbis say that the well is a place where you find your match, your destiny, your future wife or husband. Um, of course, I'm not sure I know any wells around today, folks, that you might want to look at. <laughs> but, uh, but 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 um, maybe we'll have to check around the uh, the uh, the valley area to see if we can, or the Los Angeles area, to find a couple of good wells where we can find a, a, a good husband or a good wife. Uh, but uh, <clears throat> but what's interesting is that uh, the reason Moshe knew that is because that's where Yaakov found. His wives, he found Rachel and Leah at the well. Furthermore, uh, Eliezer, Avram's trusted servant, was dispatched to find a wife for his son Yitzchak, and he found her at the well drawing water. We'll have to think about maybe all of it gives some think about uh, and come up with a good thought of why there's a connection between marriage and the well of water. In any event, 
uh, Moshe camp, camps himself there. And I believe this is a, probably what is called a subconscious prophecy. He's not really, really sure why he's drawn to the well, but he's drawn to it with a subconscious sense of destiny. <clears throat> now, along comes uh, the girls, uh, the uh, uh, um, Yitro's daughters, and they're the shepherds of the flock because Yitro had no sons. So they're taking care of the flock and bringing them to the well. Along comes some uh, rowdy uh, men, shepherds, and by use of force, push the girls away. We're coming first. We want the water instead. And it's not just a regular case of being oppressive. There was more to it. Because Yitro and his daughters had a bad reputation. Once he denied being the priesthood of his idolatry, and he no longer was part of that religion and all other religions he had rejected, he had come under, under attack and derision by all those other people who felt he was disloyal to the faith. And they claimed on him a ruling called, um, um, I forget the ruling, it's called uh, easy prey or... Uh, uh, you could do whatever you want with him uh, and, and, and a fair game it's called fair game do whatever you want and you can oppress in any way because he did this disloyalty so therefore you can oppress him you beat him up you can hurt his daughters you can take his his daughters flock away from the uh, from the uh, uh, from the well you can do whatever you want with these people because they're bad people and this shows us that Yitro had uh, even endangered himself and his family by leaving falsification um, and maintaining his beliefs of his, of his truth that he had found or his truth that he was seeking, I should say. And, um, and uh, this teaches us that that's the second step towards conversion, rejecting not just evil, but falsehood. If something is false, it has the potential for evil, and therefore you have to reject anything that speaks towards a, a, a faith of falsification of, of untruths. And he does it. So now <clears throat> Moses saves the uh, the girls and brings them, and he's brought home. And this is the next step towards conversion. Yitro invites Moshe back. He tells the girls. The man that saved you, you left him out there? Why didn't you invite him in and bring him home and have a, a meal with us? And what we learned from here, two things. That to start converting to Judaism, number one, you have to have hospitality and care for the stranger. Number two, you have to have appreciation. And we've talked about it many times that a Jew comes from the word Judah. And Judah came from the word Yehuda. And Yehuda is what we are known today as Jews or Yehudim, which comes from a basic teaching called being grateful. Yehuda, Toda, be grateful. Thank you. And that is the essence of a Jew, to be appreciative for someone who did you a kindness. And so bring him home, hospitality. And we're already becoming kind of Jewish and sensing this, this, this disregard for evil, the disregard for falsehood, this idea of humanity, of bringing a Jew, of bringing a, a stranger into your home, and of being appreciative. At this point <clears throat> in time, uh, Sipora one of Yisro's daughters marries Moshe Rabbeinu. For that to take place had to be a conversion. Why? In other words, his daughter converted before he did. Why? Well, for one thing, Moshe already had experienced the um, the experience of um, of the burning bush and the calling. And he said to his wife, you know, I love you but I have a greater love and a greater calling. And you're going to have to support me in this. 
and you don't have me exclusively anymore. I have a people to attend to and Hashem to listen to. And Zipporah accepted that. That was the completion of her conversion. By accepting the rule of Hashem, the priority of Hashem, and the recognition that you belong to a people. Not just to each other, not just to your family or your friends, or to your community, but to the whole house of Israel. All the millions of Jews that are enslaved there. They're my brothers and sisters. I feel it, says Moshe. I was born a Jew. Sipora, do you feel it? Yes, I feel it. Because I converted and joined you. And that's when you begin to understand where conversion really is moving forward. Because as it moves forward towards God, it must move forward towards the people of God as the conduit, as a direction towards God. And that is the Jewish people. Those people in Egypt that are enslaved and are suffering miserably and persecuted and are downtrodden and nobodies and nothings, those are the people of God. Do you want to join them? Are you willing to suffer along with them? Moshe was ready to do that. So was Sipon. <clears throat> On the way <clears throat> of their travel, their trip, um, <clears throat> uh, 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 Moshe did not make the decision to circumcise his newborn son. He reasoned that God told me to take the Jews out of Egypt in the, at the bush. And um, I know there's a mitzvah of bris, and I know it's eight days, because Avram circumcised his son Yitzchak at eight days. But after the bris, I can't travel with the child because it's too dangerous. For three days, we know that there is danger of recovery from the bris. And after the third day, there is recovery. And so <clears throat> it'll impede my progress. So therefore, Moshe reasoned, it's better to go and save the Jews now and neglect the bris. God did not agree with that decision. In fact, God came and sought to kill Moshe on his trip towards Egypt. At that point, Sipora realized the reason for this experience and for the near death of her husband is because they had neglected the bris, the circumcision, the brit milah. And she herself took the initiative, saved Moshe's life, circumcised her child, realizing that when you are on a mission for God, don't forget your basics. The end doesn't justify the means. Failure to do this mitzvah, because you need to do some other mitzvah, is a wrong approach. All our mitzvahs are equal. And one <clears throat> should not override the other unless there's a direct conflict. Well, let's say with human life. But other than that, the bris comes first. And the 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 uh, approach, the, 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 the mission will come second because you're already equipped with the mitzvah and the armament. But if you go without the bris, without the fundamental basics of, of the covenant between Hashem and the Jewish people, you're not worthy to, to take the Jews out or to be part of this. Sipporah realized that more than Moshe. She saved Moshe's life reaffirming her commitment. But Yisrael earlier had done something very interesting as well. When Moshe reported that he had seen God at the bush, burning bush, and received the mission to take the Jews out of Egypt, um, Yisrael responded and said, Lech the Shalom, go in peace. Moshe said, I seek my brothers. And Yisrael realized that the real truth lies in that brotherhood that Moshe Rabbeinu felt for his brothers. And that was the beginnings of understanding the sense of the Jewish people, the Jewish religion, which uh, Yisrael witnessed. And he said, 
go in peace. I'll give you my blessing. Even if it means my wife, my daughter, even if it means going to a serious suffering of Egypt and endangering yourself. I understand now that the Jewish people are a people, are a nation, are a family. It's an amazing discovery of who you guys are, said Yisro. I'm coming closer and closer to you. And so off they went, and Tzipora saves Yisro's, Moshe's life with the bris. Now, all the great things happen. Ten plagues, splitting of the sea. The Jews leave the Egypt, and they get water from a rock. And bread from heaven. And Yisro hears all about it. And the parsha begins in our parsha by Yishma Yisro. Yisro heard. He heard all the things that had happened. And Rashi enumerates some of them. Rashi says he heard the splitting of the sea. He heard of the destruction of the Egyptians. He heard of the destruction of Amalek, the nation that came to fight the Jews afterwards. He heard all of the things that happened to the Jewish people, including the coming of the Mun and the well of water. And he heard also the most significant of all, that Hashem took the Jews out of Mitzrayim. Why is that the most significant? Because now we learned that, you know what? The Jews are special. That's the real faith, the real religion, the real truth, the real Torah. Now I understand. Now I get it, says Yisro. And so, of course, Yisro um, heard it all about it. But then again, so did everybody else. Yisro wasn't the only one that heard it. It was first front page news. It was on the, uh, uh, all the stations. All the news reports, there was this sense of the knowledge of the Jewish people going through all awesome miracles. Hold on one second. And so, at this point in time, Yisro hears what everybody hears. So why is it so special that Yisro heard it? Everybody heard it. So watch what Rashi does to, a, to, a, to approach reality. Rashi says, the first passage is about Yisro hearing all that happened. The next passage talks about Yisro taking care of his daughter, Tzipora, and to, while Moshe was busy in Mitzrayim, and taking care of two sons as well, and naming the two sons. Gershom and Eliezer. You have to view verse 2, 3, and 4 as digression. In other words, it's not continuing the story. For instance, um, <clears throat> uh, Joe uh, did this. While Joe did this, remember who Joe is. Verse 2, 3, and 4, Joe was the son of uh, Danny. And Danny uh, was his cousin. And uh, Joe was married to so and so, and they had two sons. It's all not, it's not germane to the story. It has nothing to do with the story. So the fact is, is that these verses two, three, and four are digressions. You have to be able to perceive that when you look at it. It's not germane to the story at all. Who's who? Well, I guess it's important. So we'll, we'll digress for a moment. But then we come back in verse five to what it's talking about. Vayovo Yisro, Yisro comes. So what Rashi does is he takes the first word of verse one and the verse word of verse five, two verbs, and he says, Mashmuah Shoma Uba. What did Yisro hear that made him come? He connects word one of verse one 
toward one of verse five, leaving two, three, and four behind and saying they're connected, one and five. And what is heard is what is the reason he comes, which teaches you what? That Yisro is not the only man to hear what went on, but Yisro was the only man that was motivated to come. Hundreds, thousands, millions of people knew that the Jews left Egypt. Front pages of the, of the LA Times. But understand that no one did. I mean, how many people, people recently there was an earthquake in Turkey, I read. So we look on the newspapers, well, hello, Turkey, blah, blah, blah. Okay, next page. Uh, where's the funnies? I mean, the, the, no one really takes a, pays attention to what's going on in the world, except Yisro did. Yisro said, I want to be part of this incredible destiny that's going on, this history in the making. All the other people will stand side by, side by the sidelines. History will envelop, and there'll be nothing to it. Yisro says, I want to be part of this. This is, this is eternal destiny, and that's conversion. Because I'm converting, not for my position so much in this world, as for my position in the next world. Because I'm going to get treated differently because I paid attention and I made a move and I made a difference. That's Yisro's conversion. Yisro converts and says, I want to convert now. Says Rashi, What did Shmua, did, 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 what did Yisro hear that everybody else heard, but that made him come? And made him come to do what? To convert. Bull is Gaier. I'm coming to convert. I'm not coming to, to applaud you or to uh, be a non spectator or to, let's say, um, uh, 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 join in the festivities. I'm coming to become part of you. Now, you might argue well, after hearing all those great things, what's the big deal? Anybody would convert. Correct. Except nobody did. Nobody else did. He internalized the message. He internalized that the bread from heaven was from Hashem. He internalized that the water from the rock was from Hashem. He internalized that the departure was all because of Hashem. He internalized the uniqueness of the Jewish people when the Egyptians drowned and Amalek was defeated. He internalized all that. And he said, there's the truth. I've been searching all my life for truth ever since I ran away from Paro and I abandoned the, the priestlyhood in Midian. I've been looking for the truth forever and I found it. But you got to move. And he moved. And by moving, that was his conversion. Coming. Shmua Shama Uba. He heard and then he came. Listen to the two verbs. Shma, hear, Ba, come. Obviously, Shema is first, but you got to come. You can't just sit on the sidelines and wait for things to happen to you. You got to make things happen. You got to come to learn. You got to come to join. You got to come to be part of. You can't stay out there where you live in huts and bloods. You got to come into the Jewish community. Move to where the Yidden are. Move to where the shul is. Move to where the mikveh is. Move to where the, 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 the kosher is. You can't sit uh, somewhere else and, 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 and say, um, uh, 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 this was a marvelous thing. This, the, the, I, I, I look from afar and I, amaz and I sit in amazement and admiration of the Jewish people. That's not conversion. Conversion is moving towards it, becoming part of it. And Yeshua became part of it. Now, of course, as I said, the conclusion was <laughs> Yeshua changing his name from Yeser to Yisro. They had a gavav, any little slight change. Um, but there is one more conclusion. And that's the conclusion that um, happened to the Jewish people when. Um, they get in this parsha, they get the Torah. Why does the Torah write this the, the experience and the moment of the giving of the Torah in in this parsha of Yisro or Yisro in the parsha of the Torah? 
of, of the parsha of the giving of the Torah, the parsha of the story of Mount Sinai, because they're one and the same. All the Jews converted at the same moment. It's a worldwide, it's a nationwide conversion. We weren't Jewish then. We we're all converts. But how do you convert? So the Jews, of course, I think it says that they washed their garments, which indicated that they went to mikvah. We all know they have to do that. And of course, there was the circumcision. But um, what the Torah teaches is that the Jewish people received the information from Moshe Rabbeinu, and they said, Nase Venishma. We're ready to do, and we're ready to learn. And when they said that, they said, we are prepared to accept the dominion of Hashem and the enslavement to Hashem um, without really knowing what Hashem wants from us. Now, when was the last person, a person signed on a check uh, that was unfilled yet, uh, not filled out yet? Uh, sign on the check, I'll fill it out for you. Ha, ha, ha. <laughs> Who's going to do that? <laughs> you got to be out of your mind, right? I, I, I trust the guy for, and he, and he writes $100,000 in the check. Of course, it isn't a bad idea because uh, you probably don't have 100000 and it'll bounce anyway. But point is, is that, point is, is that, are we willing to accept whatever Shem throws at us, even if we don't know? So at the conversion ceremony, we say to the candidate, are you willing to accept the full 613 mitzvahs as the Jews did at Mount Sinai? And the candidate says, yes, hopefully. Uh, we also offer the candidate a chance to, to, to turn back and uh, uh, while he or she's in the water, you want to you change your mind? <laughs> Some of them laugh and say, no, no, no. Um, but uh, the, the other thing that we we uh, we do is we we uh, tell the candidate, um, are you willing to accept all six thirteen, even those you don't know? I mean, you've spent a year or so with Rabbi Block and Rabbi Rosenberg in classes. Do you know all the mitzvahs? No. I know lots. I'm happy to learn the mitzvah book. I reviewed it, but I don't know them all or all the details. So you mean that as years to come, you're going to continue learning, which is what the Jewish people said to Hashem. We will continue to learn. Nishma. But are you willing to accept, as of today, new mitzvahs that you will learn tomorrow? And the day after. And that's when the candidate has to answer the affirmative in order for there to be a kosher conversion. There is nothing that you can have a sense of, um, of an unwillingness to do, even if you don't know it yet. You might come across a mitzvah that you really find uncomfortable or... Uh, unhappy with, or you might say, I can't, I don't believe this, I don't understand this. You have to be willing to accept it, not when you learn it, but as of today, beforehand. And the Jewish people answered the affirmative to God, not seven Ishma, we'll do and we'll learn. So the idea that they're willing to accept or will do is, of course, the conversion. And the words together, not seven nishma, we'll do and we will learn, did not appear together in the Torah till next week's portion, till Mishpatim. Here it says just not, so we'll do it. Next week, this coming Shabbos, it says, not seven nishma, we will do it and learn. So what did the Jewish people add with the word learn? We'll do it, done. We're going to do it, and we'll go. We'll do it sight unseen. We'll do it in, even in full trust of you. Whatever mitzvah you say is the right thing to do. No question about it. I accept. That's not good enough. You see, because our religion 
is different than all other religions where it demands not just doing the right thing, but learning about it. Not just following Hashem, that's of course, that's without saying, but also appreciating what Hashem says. Sometimes I come across a mitzvah that I don't really appreciate because I don't really understand it so well. It doesn't uh, resonate with me. And um, I'll do it anyway. I'm loyal. Good, but not good enough. You must learn to come to appreciate it, to understand God's mindset and make your mindset equal with his and accepting of his and appreciative of his. This rule would sound so ridiculous or so counterproductive. I come to understand that this is the real goodness of Hashem. And I learned to see goodness in something that sounds horrible. There's a mitzvah to destroy the evil nation of Amalek. Nazis. A mitzvah to kill them. Kill them. We don't negotiate with them. We kill them. Now, can a Nazi do tshuva? Um, it depends how, how uh, atrocious his behavior was. And uh, uh, obviously, um, if it gets to the point of, of atrocity, no, he cannot do tshuva. He has to be destroyed. Now, killing a person is, not, is, a, is a mitzvah. But it's not a pleasant mitzvah. No one enjoys it. But you understand God's wisdom and God's truth that evil must be eradicated. No one likes to go to a funeral, but it's a mitzvah. You have to do it. And bury the dead. Our custom is when we start burying, by the way, our custom is that we don't let the goyim bury. Not, no, 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 uh, um, uh, grave diggers. We do it. We take care of our own. That's our peoplehood, our nationhood. And so we start the burial and we turn the shovel upside down. Or I should say, uh, not upside down, but overturned uh, to show our reluctance to do this mitzvah. And then we turn it back and do it after the first throw of dirt. In other words, we uh, understand our religion, uh, our reluctance to do the mitzvah, and yet our obligation to do so, not only because God said so, but because we know it's true. It's the right thing to do. Visiting the sick is oftentimes unpleasant. I'm tongue-tied. I don't know what to say. Comforting the mourner. What should I say? I sit there visiting him or her and feel stupid. Our custom is you should say nothing. Let the mourner begin the conversation. Your presence alone is comforting. The idea is, is that you sense God's truth in every mitzvah we have even in brand new ones. So the idea is not just we're going to do it, but we're going to learn about it. And that was the conversion of the Jewish people. And that's what Yisro joined at the time of the giving of the Torah at Mount Sinai. And um, Yisro is our prototype or role model for conversion. Um, and I think that conversion change in a person's life uh, has to be definitive and complete in order for it to be uh, to be so without with with, with a, uh, a, a, re, a a rejection of the outside culture Jewish names Jewish language I learned Hebrew folks and Jewish uh, and Jewish clothing a woman was, walks with her hair covered you know she's Jewish a man walks with a kippah, he's Jewish. And these kind of identifications that make our change total to within our own culture at the rejection of all other cultures. Okay, 
So I got my problem. What about baseball? Rabbi Block likes baseball. It's American. It's apple pie and Chevrolet. <laughs> Rabbi Block, what are you going to do about baseball? The answer is, it is permissible to enjoy uh, wisdom or appreciate values within the non-Jewish world. We just can't adopt the culture. In other words, baseball is a game, provides entertainment, it has wisdom to it, there's things to appreciate, there are values. The very fact that you're seeing the Star Spangled Banner in front of a game is a value. I once told a policeman at the ballpark, I challenged him, what are the last two words of the Star Spangled Banner? And he said, land at a free home at a break? And I said, no. The last two words of the Star Spangled Banner is play ball. <laughs> Point is, is that there is a value for people getting together to cheer, but it's certainly dis d d despicable if it gets into hatred for the other person because he's like, I want the other team. Uh, there's got to be um, humanity maintained. Um, so we have to be very cautious with the non Jewish culture. Now, today's the Super Bowl. Everybody's talking about that Super Bowl. <laughs> Super Bowl. Well, there's good eats. I'm not allowed to eat them. <laughs> but the truth is, you see, is that the Super Bowl is a football game. How do you play a game where the purpose of the game is to hit the other man and bring him down to the ground? So I have to worry about football. Baseball is a little more civilized. <laughs> In any event, the point is to be very careful and on guard around uh, regarding the culture surrounding us, non-Jewish music, uh, non-Jewish movies, values that they portray, the new non-Jewish uh, Gentile uh, morals that are being proposed in legislation. We have a definitive and unquestionable rejection of it all. And this is the real conclusiveness to the, to the conversion. I once was something else. Today I'm different. And that occurs not just to non-Jews who convert, but occurs to Jews who become Balchubis. The Jews at Mount Sinai had to undergo conversion. The Jews of today have to undergo the same conversion that non-Jews do if they're non-observant. And they have to join together in observance and in rejection of a past lifestyle. We have to propose and suggest and share Shabbos, kosher, mitzvahs with all of our non-religious brethren, with non-religious Jews. That's part of the conversion process too. To build up our nation, build up our people, so that we are not only are numerous quantitatively, but we're also major contributors qualitatively by virtue of our total commitment to the observance. And I guess that's the end of the day, the bottom line, observance. Keep mitzvahs, do the mitzvahs, follow Hashem's ways, accept it all, total faith. And that represents a complete commitment and a complete transformation. And transformation isn't a bad idea. Change is good. Every day we change a little bit. Conversion may be a major change, but every day after conversion, we want to change again and again and again, over and over and over again, every day, growing, becoming better and bigger. I'm a better Jew today than I was yesterday. I'm a better person today than it was yesterday. That's the notion, the idea of accepting the Torah, prepared to do it, sight unseen, 
and anxious to learn more about it so that I can grow with it and appreciate it and high and qualitatively upgrade my religious observance. I go to shul every Shabbat. I come 10 minutes late. From now on, I'm coming on time. I try to keep kosher very much. I wait five hours after meat because before eating dairy. Now I'm going to wait six the proper way. Grow better, bigger. I prayed today. Tomorrow I'm going to pray with a deeper intensity, with a greater feeling. I do kindness, but sometimes I find myself not as complete in my kindness. I could do better. I could be more careful from speaking Lush and Hara and saying gossip and slander. I can do that, but I got to be willing to grow to do that. Conversion, change, transformation is willingness to grow, to become bigger and better, qualitatively, quantitatively. I'm going to upgrade my level of mitzvahs and add more mitzvahs. And that is the message of the Jewish people as they, as they accepted the Torah. That's who we are. We're growing people and developing people each and every day. So uh, <clears throat> thank you all for joining.